Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming to the presentation this afternoon. Uh, so my name is Julian Dunn. I'm Director of Product Marketing here at Chef. And I'm joined on stage by Fletcher Nickel, who's a senior software engineer at Chef. Um, Fletcher and I worked together to launch Habitat a couple of years ago, and uh, I was the product manager at the time. In the intervening time, I've moved on to marketing, as you can tell, which really <laughs> makes no difference. I still have a technical background, but my computer boots in a PowerPoint now instead of you know regular internal. Um, Fletcher's is still a normal it's, laptop. It's still booting into a terminal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so what we wanted to talk about today was really about architecture. And what I thought we would do is we're going to talk about systems architecture, software architecture. Personally, I think the best way to talk about architecture is to relate it to real things in the real world. And so let's think about good buildings and physical architecture design. Um, and one of the most famous buildings in the world is this building here, um, which is, if you haven't seen it before, it's uh, Habitat 67. Name is totally coincidental, <laughs> by the way. We did not name the project after this building. It's uh, happened, we found this out later. Um, but this complex in Montreal, um, as you can see, was built for Expo 67, which was Canada's 100th anniversary. Um, this is a great time for me to uh, call out any Canadians in the room, including Sean Porter, Sensu CTO. Fletcher and I are both <laughs> Canadians, so the way I like to describe this is, uh, yeah, right. Let's, let's, yeah, yeah. let's say that. Exactly. <laughs> So the way I like to describe it is Canadians are kind of like Americans. We're kind of like ninjas that walk amongst you and whisper in your ears about things like universal health care and <laughs> you know, one-year maternity leave policy. And also, our prime minister is super hot. That's the other thing. Um, OK, anyway, enough of that. Uh, so architecture specifically, as you can see, this building was so famous that Canada chose to feature it as the stamp, um, as the 150th anniversary stamp um, for Canada's uh, 150th anniversary in 2017. And uh, when I think about what was so uh, iconic about this particular building, and here's another shot of it, a little, bit, um, a little bit fuller shot, there's a couple of different things that the architect, his name is Moshi Safdi, who was a groundbreaking architect. This is one of his very first projects. Actually, I believe he was a grad student at the time. Um, and this was what his intention was in building this particular complex was to create a, a modular kind of uh, complex, a system that could actually be used as low-cost housing to be uh, distributed around the world uh, for, um, you know, for a lot of, for basically affordable housing purposes. Um, and so you can actually think, that, remember the time frame of this is sort of the early 1960s, and if you physically look at this building, it kind of looks a lot like containerization, actually, right? Um, but probably, if you were to build this today, you probably would use something like shipping containers, but you got to remember that at the time, containers did exist in the world, but they weren't the standardized TEU format containers that we know today, which is probably why he simulated a lot of the components or the way in which containers work um, by building and using shared components, prefab components that were assembled on site. So you can kind of see in the middle there, this very top, um, you know, that component there, which the, you know, with that rectangular window across the top, that's replicated over on the right-hand side. And this was a pretty novel building technique at the time, um, assembled totally on site. Also, the ability to kind of share components uh, in, this, in this system, because as you can see, the roof of one particular unit also happens to be the garden of the next unit above it. So it, it, you know, especially in Montreal, I don't know if you folks have been to Montreal, if you go there in February, you know it's extremely cold. Um, and so it's you know, energy efficiency and just sharing services reduces the energy cost, because remember, what he's going for here is affordable housing. And number three, what he built into this complex was a set of shared services. Again, thinking that this was going to be a very large community. So there's uh, schools, retail complex, you know, recreation, this sort of thing built into the ground floor of the system. And if I start to think about these characteristics as applied to software architecture, there's a lot of things when we talk about building microservice-oriented architectures today that have a lot of relationship with some of the features that he built into this project. Now, modular, self-contained, prefab components, well, that sounds a lot like every component being responsible for its own resiliency availability, um, if you've read Jeff Bezos' memo about you know, Amazon's architecture. Components having peer-to-peer -peer level dependencies, well, that sounds a lot like, again, modern microservices, where you have different components depending on, depending on each other. And number three, the complex sharing services as a whole, again, sounds a lot like all components having sort of a base substrate of things that they depend on in the software system, like management interfaces, deployment, right, monitoring, uh, availability, observability, all this kind of thing is like a shared, a shared service. 
So visually, this is the whole complex, by the way. It's an extremely large and complex system. So you can kind of see why he built those features into this particular complex. Now, if you look at this visually and line it up against the largest modern microservice architectures today, again, visually, there's this duality, and it looks, looks very similar. I want to put these pictures up side by side so that you can kind of see that. <laughs> and when you get to complex systems this big, what your problem isn't is adding the next service into this system because you're probably already really good at those components in there. Your problem is actually a management problem. How do you deal with all this complexity? And if you don't architect your system to have and to think about management and how you're going to manage this complexity from day one, it's awfully hard to add that onto the end of it. So what we're going to talk about today is architectural patterns that optimize for management of extremely large systems because you want to design them in in the first place. So what I want to address is in terms of how we've done management in the past, we've always thought of, at, especially at smaller scale, we like to use the word orchestration to manage things. And what I want to do is, well, I want to define what I'm talking about when I talk about orchestration because, again, now I work in marketing so I can kind of say this, but there's a lot of marketing people out there that throw this word around and just like, you know, you know paint it on everything because it sounds really cool. I mean, who doesn't like a nice orchestra, right? All these people in tuxedos. But <laughs> Specifically to me, what I mean by orchestration is applied to management of these sorts of systems is a particular way of managing systems that is basically like this. You have some ordered set of operations that you can do sequentially across a set of machines that are completely independent. They don't really know about one, uh, one another. And by machines, I also could mean like containers or you know, basically places where you're running applications. And they're only, the only way in which they can communicate or change state is through a central orchestration system that's connected via a network. Now, orchestration systems, these have been around for a very long time. Here's a few from kind of the last technology generation for managing things, these like IBM Cloud OO or Cloud Orchestrator, HP OO, like your VMware vRealize, this kind of a thing. Okay, well. Is this familiar to anybody, by the way? Because like, I had not seen these before, and they kind of made me nervous. It's like, is this anybody's world right now? Yeah. No? OK. <laughs> I mean, we kind of moved on from this way of doing things. Um, what we did is, well, we didn't want people to basically click around and use Microsoft Visio to manage their fleet. Because yes. like, you click the wrong button, and you just blow things up. So what we did is you know, incremental changes. We moved on to kind of having a world where humans are acting on code, infrastructure as code, that are now acting on these machines. So, forces me to you know, revise my definition a little bit, to kind of you know, inject this in here, that look, these ordered set of operations, we're going to define them in code. But everything else in the architectural pattern is still kind of the same. Originally, I wrote some Ansible uh, to illustrate this, but I recognize that everybody knows Ansible. So everybody kind of knows shell scripting. So uh, the way in which you would do, and I've written shell scripts like this, as of my background as a sysadmin, that was um, where I spent most of my career, is you know, you're going to deploy something, so you're going to log into the load balancer, you're going to quiesce that load balancer, or disable the VIF or whatever. Then maybe you're going to do some database stuff, database migration or what have you. Then you're going to sequentially log into all these app servers and do some that, deploy, right? That's where it's getting dangerous, I think. <laughs> and then you're like, sweet, all's done. I'm going to enable my load balancer. So there's a number of different problems with this orchestration-oriented approach, in particular um, as per pertains to management. And they sort of fall on two axes. And I'll touch on each of these areas specifically. And the axes are basically about resilience and scalability. And resilience is not only the deployment resilience, but also your overall operational resilience. And then from a scalability perspective, often we get fixated, because we're technical people, we get fixated on technical scalability. But what I also want to talk about is cognitive scalability and where this starts to break down. First of all, around deployment resilience, when you do something like this, this is all great in a world where um, you have a data center um, that the network is perfectly, you know, 100%, there's no latency, no packet loss, no noisy neighbors. This kind of worked really well when we were all running in only data center, uh, data center environments. But now you're in the cloud where the network can blow up halfway through your deployment, right? That server goes down, Amazon decides to do some maintenance or whatever, and that's not there. And so what you end up doing with, there's sort of two approaches when you're trying to apply orchestration to a world where you're building these systems on an unreliable fabric like this that can go down at any time. One is you try to add more error handling into the system. What should this thing do <laughs> if I lose one of these components? Should I roll the whole thing back? Should I say, to hell with it, it's probably gone? 
Um, should I just accept it? Should I do some, some other recovery operation? And what you end up with is like, it doesn't matter if you're doing this in shell scripts, you're probably not, right? You're probably using Chef or Ansible or something like this or some other tool that you deploy, is you end up making that orchestration recipe extremely complicated to try and deal with every single error condition that might happen. Because the issue is when you're taking an orchestration approach, the whole thing, this entire deployment was intended to run as one atomic set either all the way to completion or not at all. And when it doesn't, it kind of breaks the whole, per the whole um, theory of orchestration, which is one, one of the huge problems. I do want to mention that kind of modern systems like Kubernetes, what they try to do is they accept the fact that you have this, that you have this atomicity of a very large deployment. And the way in which they deal with this, as you know, with the sort of blue-green model in Kubernetes, is what we're going to do is try to stand up an entire replica of our, of our system, make sure that it's actually working properly, and then we're going to cut it over. Now, this does work. I'm not saying that it doesn't work, but it adds a lot of complexity into the system. Um, because it's kind of a bummer if what we wanted to do is to make one small change, and then we're spending a lot of time spinning up a whole bunch of other stuff and making sure that it's working, and then cutting over to it and tearing down a bunch of stuff. And that's because we're still taking this sort of central, centralized orchestration approach. The other thing is you have this operational resilience issue when the components at the edges, the parts of the applications, they don't actually know about each other. They don't know about each other's state except through that central orchestrator. So you're really depending very heavily on that orchestrator to never go down and to keep all that state when you're trying to, when you're trying to operate this thing. So when you think about the pattern of this sort of a world, um, who does it actually benefit when you've taken the resilience of your application plane and delegated it to this back plane, which must be up at all times? If your back plane isn't up at all times, now you're in trouble because your application fleet is completely dead in the water because nothing can orchestrate it. This benefits, of course, your cloud provider. The cloud provider that is now offering in the sort of pre-Cambrian explosion of hosted Kubernetes services, right? Your GKEs, your AKSs, your AWS Fargates, and so on and so forth, right? Because they want you to adopt this pattern so that you can delegate all that responsibility for the 100% uptime of the orchestrator to them, and then you, you're kind of plugged in and, and locked into that model. So just kind of be aware of that. The incentives are there um, for, this, for this sort of model to um, really accrue value to them, to those folks. All right. So cognitive scalability. Um, you know, I really don't have much to say about this one, I guess, other than that orchestration systems or these operations, orchestration operations, they become really difficult to understand when the more entities that you have involved in this kind of orchestration world. Um, in particular because this, again, as I mentioned before, your orchestration activity or your play, if you will, um, is really intended to run all the way to completion or not at all. Um, and so trying to debug those failures halfway through is extremely difficult. This is a real life scenario. This is something I was trying to write some, a bunch of Terraform to do a bunch of stuff. And then it said halfway through, it said, oh, you've got a cycle somewhere in your Terraform. I'm like, okay, great. Um, help me debug this cycle. I think the command is Terraform viz or graph viz or whatever, right? And it dumps out like a four meg viz and it says, oh, your cycle's in here somewhere. There's a giant thing. I'm like, that? I still don't <laughs> see it. And then the screen's it's not, much it's bigger not this time. to me. You know, I probably had like a secu you know, security group <laughs> rules depending on each other or whatever. But what it forced me to do, this sort of orchestration approach, is instead of, I'm pretty sure where this cycle is, instead what it forced me to do is page in the entire working set of this global state into my head to try and figure out what exactly is going on. So when things go wrong, operationally, it's always easier I think for the human brain to try and understand a small part of the system, you always have that suspicion about where things are going wrong, or you can start from an error message that came from one component and fan out from that. And orchestration-oriented architectures don't really give you that flexibility to be able to do that. You often have to kind of page in more than you actually need to. And programmers have kind of known this for a long time. This is why we have in computer science and programming, while we have concepts like locality of reference and information hiding, it's exactly for this purpose so that you don't under, need to understand your entire code base to kind of understand what this particular component is doing. Put more simply, we have the father of DevOps, Patrick Dubois, which is, look, developers are working on individual microservices. That, that's really the only context that they need to understand. But if you're in charge of operating the whole system, Will that deployment or that architecture actually fit inside your head when you're actually trying to fix these problems? All right, so the last point that I'll make around this um, is, in our view, the future is just is gonna be distributed, more and more distributed. And you can kind of see the history of computing is kind of like this. Now, 
the feature being distributed is not necessarily a straight line. So let me walk through a little bit of history about this. So in the early days, we had mainframes, and we still have mainframes, as somebody mentioned this morning. 32%? 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, yeah. 30 percent <laughs> cumulative annual growth rate or whatever in mainframe sales. But anyway, it originally started with mainframes. And the mainframe experience was you wrote a bunch of punch cards, you wrote four random punch cards, you walked them over to the computer center, you gave them to the operator, you came back in three hours, probably with an error message, right? Instead of, sometimes you'd get your actual result. And that was kind of a bummer, because it's winter, and especially if you're like, you know, you live in Edmonton or something like that, like you don't want to walk down to the computer center. What you want to do is to, you know, get through error messages from the comfort of your own home, right? <laughs> so we invented time sharing for this purpose, which it's still, you know, a little bit more distributed. Now we had these green screen terminals in our lab or in our homes, but most of the processing was still happening in a central, central point. Then along came sort of through the late 70s, 80s, 90s, with mini computers, and then with um, server, client server computing, we started becoming more distributed. We started creating applications that were thick clients that would do a little bit of processing on our desktops and then do some processing on the back end. And then we actually took a little bit of a step back when we got to what I call the web 1.0. Because what happened was we started extending computing, network-based computing, to consumer devices. And I don't know if, about you, but like my grandma's computer is like probably like a 386 or something like that, right? Ter not terribly powerful devices. And so we started to centralize a lot of that processing, um, again, on, on central computers on very powerful servers. Then the web 2.0 kind of made things more distributed again, right? Today we have React or Angular and these sorts of frameworks and we have very powerful laptops that sometimes rival the power even of our servers. So we have the ability to split that processing between these two halves. Now what I would argue is now when we have moved to, when I talk about cloud, what I mean is like, you know, these machine learning or analytics types of systems, we've actually taken a little bit of a step back away from distribution, where we're now centralizing a lot of the data processing in the cloud and the, the endpoints or the workstations that we're connecting to it are actually not holding a lot of that load. But over time, I think we're gonna tend towards, again, a more distributed kind of world, particularly with the Internet of Things. So if you think about today, we're only just beginning to scratch the surface of what IoT looks like, because if you think about like your Bluetooth connected light bulbs, your doorknobs, they're really actually kind of dumb devices, right? They have a really low power chip in there, but they're actually not doing any work. What they're doing today is sending, mostly collecting data and sending it again to the central cloud ML kind of analytics pipeline or processing system. And over time, you already kind of see this, right, with edge computing, is that processing is going to end up more on the edge. And that's really because what we want to do is to provide people real-time user experience when they're disconnected from the Internet. Now, how many of you folks watch the show Silicon Valley and saw this app? I mean, this started out as a joke, as a plot line within the, the television show. So for, for those of you who don't watch it, you know, there was this whole plot line where this fellow, um, Jin Yang, who's a character on the show, right, he wrote this app that was like, effectively, um, you could take out your phone and scan something to see if it's a hot dog or not a hot dog. Um, and then HBO kind of doubled down on this joke by actually building this app. Um, <laughs> So it's actually pretty funny. I have it on my phone. It was oh, a lot of fun to go and scan things. And by the way, it, it's actually really good because they've trained the neural network really well. So you can scan things <laughs> like just a bun and it's like, that's not a hot dog. Scan just a wiener. That's not a hot dog either. But anyway, <laughs> the initial version <laughs> of this application, you can read this blog post. Um, there's a Medium blog post from the software developer that wrote this application. And their initial implementation was actually, this is a TensorFlow app. TensorFlow, uh, Keras, and React Native. So originally they wrote this app and it was completely centralized. So they were running this model centrally. The problem is if you're giving this application, the experience to people on the phone, you know, you're, what, you're, what you're running around is maybe you're in, like I used to live in New York, so maybe you're you know, two levels down in Penn Station and you're at the hot dog stand. You're like, <laughs> I wanna play with this thing. Perfect. There's no cell phone service down there, right? So the experience is horrible for that. Um, and so what they actually did, believe it or not, is to train this entire neural network and then put it on your phone. So there's a neural network running on your Android or your, or your Apple phone to do this image recognition, right, so that they can pull off this excellent user experience for folks. And this is what I mean by the world becomes more distributed. 
um, because you really about, like let's say, here's another example. You know, you have these smart shoes, right? Like the Nike shoes that you now can, you know, they measure, you know, how quickly you're running or this kind of a thing, right? It'd be a super bummer if you were like, I'm gonna go for a run in the woods and then I'm gonna ask my shoe, how's my gait? How quickly am I running? And it's like, sorry, I can't connect to the internet right now, right? <laughs> like, come back in three hours when you get home. Like, that's a pretty awful experience, right? So that's why computing is moving more to the edge. So what we really want Hopefully you'll, you'll sort of buy my story here. <laughs> what we really want is distributed autonomous systems to be architected. Systems that make progress towards some desired state in sort of an eventually consistent manner. Expose interfaces for others to be able to verify the promises and the state of their, their progress towards those promises. And number three, can promise to take, fail, to, take, to take certain behaviors in the face of the failure of other behaviors. And these sorts of things sound a lot like stuff that this guy wrote, right? Mark Burgess, sounds a lot like convergent configuration management theory, promise theory, and this kind of a thing, right? So even though configuration management has been touched on a couple times, I mean, configuration management has been around for 10 years, and you know, as we move over to containers and things like this, it's becoming less popular, but there's still a lot of lessons to be learned in the theory that was behind configuration management, because what it really addresses is how do you build resilient systems that are extremely distributed and autonomous. So, that gets me into the design of Sensu and Habitat. Yeah, we see did it. We, see how we did that? We just don't have the heart, just a picture of yeah. heart here. Or a large <laughs> plus, plus emoji. I was gonna get two bananas from the stand and hold them together. Probably. Two hot dogs. Anyway, yeah, exactly, two hot dogs. <laughs> yeah. So the design of Sensu to start with versus traditional monitoring, and I'm sure you know, this has been touched on a few times, but again, the traditional way in which systems, monitoring systems, I'm picking on Nagios here because other people have picked on Nagios, but this is the way in which traditional monitoring systems would have worked. You had a centralized, heavyweight, kind of master system that had all the logic and all the data, and all the agents out there were just pulled on an interval and they didn't really do anything. So if your master goes away, then the entire monitoring system is completely dead in the water. But Sensu is a system that flips that on its head, as you all know, where more of the logic and more of the work is pushed out to the edges, and the back end has less data in it, right? It's effectively a collector. So this allows you things like to to create more resilience in the system. Because if your back end goes away, then the agents will just queue all their events and will just send them when the back end is, is back up, right? So it's a lot easier then also to distribute different checks and, and things like that and to monitor the operation of the agents than it is to be like, oh my God, my Nagios master isn't scaling anymore because that was the, that was the design. Now over in the Habitat world, the Habitat runtime system, the supervisor system, is effectively a network-connected supervision system, process supervision system. So you can kind of think of it like if system D and console or SCD kind of got together, had a baby. So process supervision with lifecycle hooks, plus creating a shared state for real-time reactive management that you can inject changes into the system. And the system, right, so you're progressing the, the, the system as a whole towards a new state, towards a new set of promises. And all those machines just figure it out on their own and they eventually converge on that state. So it's using, it, as, a, as I was saying, right, it creates an eventually consistent global state. We're using a protocol called SWIM, which allows us to have a completely masterless peer-to-peer -peer membership protocol. So the benefits that it, that it creates for a system like, I mean, this could be any app, but you know, I'll put Sensu up here, right, because obviously we're at the Sensu conference. But it allows you to do things like, in contrast to tr traditional monitoring systems where to stand up certain things, in, like you would have to stand up uh, back end before you stand up the things that you're actually, um, that the agents where they're actually running because, hey, the agents can't actually connect to the back end so they'll fail. Instead, Habitat allows you to do deployments and to stand up applications in an architecture where you're like, I don't care what order I'm standing everything up, and let's turn it all on. Let's go to the, turn on all the circuit breakers, right? And they all figure it out because what, ends up, what happens is if the state isn't met where the agents have a back end to connect to, the supervisor will just spin because those real-time requirements haven't been met until that back end actually comes online. And so to show off some of those elements, I'm gonna turn it over to Fletcher, who's right. gonna give you a demo of Sensu running in Habitat. Yeah, now it's time for my password. Yeah. First try, all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I've been kind of watching all day to see kind of who's talking about what and who's showing what and realizing uh, what I was gonna sort of show 
was a little bit of Habitat and a little bit of Sensu, and I wanted to show the Sensu 2 stuff, and I realized maybe I'm showing some like first demo stuff of Sensu 2, so that's kind of cool. Um, and so yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully I don't give like Sean a heart attack or anything, because <laughs> I'm self-taught, and, and I'm like really new, and it's, it's pretty good, and I'm excited. <laughs> so um, what I thought I would show here is um, this, this idea of the um, sort of like distributed actors at the edge that can, that can sort of like self-assemble and make some progress um, when it's appropriate for them to, and then kind of like, you know, wait when that's appropriate. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up a, um, a group of Habitat supervisors, so we call that a ring. They, they kind of, they gossip around, so if you've set up similar kind of systems before, they're just all talking, loosely connected, all that stuff. And um, what I'm gonna do here is show, um, basically I'm gonna drive this. I've just got uh, like Docker for Mac, um, and so I'll just be spinning these in Docker containers, um, but because it's fun to do not the most straightforward thing, um, what I'm doing, you can see kind of all this stuff at the top is sort of like you know the, the Docker necess necessary stuff. I basically just have a, a Docker container that has like Alpine Linux, and our Habitat client with the supervisor installed just so that it saves some time. Um, so you could think of when I'm running these as like quickly booting a VM or an empty container if you wanna run that and then have it sort of like install from there. Um, Habitat also has a way to take um, the Habitat packages that you make and you can export them as Docker containers and run those and I considered doing that but I thought this is, um, this kind of is just bucking a more straightforward sort of thing. So uh, what I'm gonna do is run um, this, this first supervisor, um, whenever you have systems like this that are peer-based, uh, the hardest thing is always like, where do I connect to like wire myself in? So w all I'm really doing is just like running the first one and then telling all the other ones, hey, join this peer, and then they'll all sort of like inform each other and then we just bootstrap without having these, these like peer join kind of problems. So um, what I have ran, I'll just go back to this here. And, what I, what I tried to call it is just sort of at the bottom, that's sort of like just the Habitat part about what I'm doing is I'm, I'm running a Habitat supervisor and this core Nginx is just a, a Habitat package. So you could think it's sort of analogous to like a Docker image, but it's, it's again to, uh, to, to Greg's point, like packages are great and like we all do packages. Habitat package is effectively, you know, a XC compressed tarball at the end of the day. So like tarballs are great with metadata. Um, so I'm just saying I wanna run a supervisor with this package and I'm just overriding a default for, um, that allows me to kind of uh, remote query and control the supervisor a little bit because it just helps for the purpose of a demo. And um, you can sort of see it running here, sort of the parts that are in green is kind of the, the supervisor doing its, its work and then the stuff afterwards is you know, the output of what services that it's sort of helping to run. So I'm just running Nginx. Um, because that's gonna help me show off some of the asset stuff, which was also exciting to listen to Greg's talk, because I'm like, this is what I wanted to show. Um, so you get to see some of that. Um, and what I'm gonna do next is fire up, um, again, this is uh, like Sensu2 stuff, so um, you can forget the, the 1.x stuff. If I'm talking about something and I'm using the wrong terms, like, it's because I've got like Sensu2 on the brain. Um, so I'm gonna set up um, a few uh, agents next, and that might sound not totally correct, because like, you probably want a back end to talk to first, but I'm gonna like, do the awkward thing first. And uh, so what I'm gonna do is uh, we, have, um, we have some Habitat packages for the Sensu2 uh, components. Um, what I did when I kinda came on site this week is take a look at those and realize, hey, there's a few beta releases, so I like, immediately bumped that. And, uh, I'm not really showing the Habitat build system, but um, that's you know another talks and demos. We've got our booth, we can dig more into that. Um, what I did is I just took the, our sort of like core world of, of package definitions of, of plans, and I just uh, basically forked it, adapted it, and then built it for myself. So that F nickel is just sort of like my namespace, my origin, signing the package. So I'm gonna run the agent. This peer part, that's, that's back to Habitat saying like, hey, just join that one supervisor so we can like form up and then um, I've got sort of this strategy in bind, and this is a way that you can uh, tell a service when, when you're running it in Habitat that like, the strategy is like the update strategy. So what I'm, what I'm gonna tell these Sensu agents is, hey, go run yourself, but um, 
the supervisor is going to just have a periodic uh, timer that's going to look back at the package repository to see if there's anything newer. Um, what I want you to do is like, no matter how many of them are or if, if they're self-clustered or not, as soon as you see an update and that's like reasonable, just update yourself. And um, it'll also you know, do a check on boot so that if, if I had something installed locally but I see there's something new, it'll just like install that first before starting. And then lastly, this idea of a, of a bind is a, we call that a, this a service binding. So this is that problem of trying to express that like, hey, I'm an agent. Um, and what I kind of need to make forward progress ideally is, is a back end so that like I, I need to know where to point my stuff at and how to like wire up and then we get like our socket and we can talk. So this is kind of like the habitat speak for how you can sort of declare a runtime service dependencies through these binds. And so if I, uh, I'll fire one of these up and just kind of full screen it a little bit and you can see uh, this is like the supervisor firing up and what the supervisor was doing is I told it to to run this package, so it was just making sure that all the dependencies of that package were there in the version, they were installed and verified, um, and then it starts to run it, and what you're seeing here is not the Sensu agent at this point, it's actually the supervisor that knows that this service has something it needs at runtime, so it's looking you know, through, the, through the gossip, um, and it's trying to discover, do I have a backend um, with this particular cluster name, and so it doesn't see it yet, so all the supervisor is doing is it's just like it's just hanging out and waiting um, for a backend because at that point the supervisor, as that like autonomous actor on the edge, can make some forward progress and then start the service up. Um, I think it was yesterday I learned some of the uh, connection like logic. If there's no backend there, and like I, I think the behavior right now is like it will basically just give up and crash, which is also a super nice. Um, behavior that works well with Habitat. In this case, like, we're not even gonna bother to start it. So what I'll do is I'll just start a couple more of those so we have a few of them running and get those going. Um, and what I'm gonna do next is um, I'm gonna start the back ends up. Uh, but one thing I found interesting or when I was looking at this uh, uh, clustering of the back ends, which is I think fairly new, and you can all forgive me if it's not gonna be like 100% production grade ready, but it works pretty cool <laughs> for me right now, um, is I, I basically need to tell uh, the like etcd, the storage engine on the inside of the back end, I need to tell it like, we're gonna be starting like a new like data set or like we're gonna start from scratch. So I could start these back ends up and, and you'll just see them sort of flailing because they're confused. Um, and what, what, I, what we're doing through the Habitat package is we have this idea of like configuration. So you can um, apply configuration sort of via gossip into the ring and say like, I have this information destined for like this, this service group cluster. And when that service group comes up or if it's up already, sort of picks that up, merges that in with its package defaults and then does whatever's, you know, kind of, um, whatever's appropriate for that service. And, and you're kind of defining that in Habitat package. So, um, what I'll do is, um, so, so to kind of, uh, do, again, do this in an, a bit of an odd order, and that might be too high, is um, I'm, uh, in Habitat speak, I'm applying some config. So I'm setting some config and sort of like preceding it into an environment before that service is even around. And um, th what you're kind of seeing on the left-hand side is this is just like a one line of Tomal config, and I'm just sort of piping it in here. There's like more than a few ways to do this. And then the little hack with the date on the end is I just want like a version for that and like second since Unix epoch's gonna work for another, how many years was this, Paul? We we're talking about this. There's, there's a drop dead date. So this is gonna work for the next few years. Um, anyways, this, so um, what I've done is basically preceded this config into the ring and then um, I'm gonna go, I'm sorry, I will show what firing the back end up um, is gonna be like, so again, same, just bookkeeping. I'm gonna run the Sensu backend um, package as a service, same peer join. Um, I just changed my, uh, this, th this idea of topology is if I'm gonna launch a bunch of backends and our group names are the same and it's the same package, we're sort of like inherently clustered already. We don't need to work together or be aware that we're in the same cluster, but by me kind of, um, I'm sort of like just applying a little more intent and saying like, you know, I, I actually kind of want you to sort of behave as though you're like in a leader follower cluster. And a side effect of that is um, what we do in Habitat is we sort of wait till there's a minimum of 
three of those services before we just launched that. So we got some minimum voting quorum. Um, in this case, I'm not actually using the, the notion of a leader being elected to start it. I'm just sort of like going for it. But um, what it lets you do is when, you, when I fire a back end up here, um, you'll see same kind of dance of installing packages or yeah, and ensuring they're all there. And um, now what's going on is uh, this waiting to execute hooks election in progress. This is basically the supervisor, again, knowing that like, I need at least two more buddies uh, before I make forward progress and boot, boot whatever this is, because we're supposed to collaborate and sort of like work as a team. So when I fire a couple more up, these numbers on the end is just port mapping. Um, I didn't even actually think to bring up the, uh, the dashboard. <laughs> I think talking to Caleb yesterday, I'm like, I didn't even think to bring that up. It was pretty cool. Um, so once we got the three up, you'll see these other two are just going to start to emit more lines, which is basically we've got our third member, and we're going to do our election, and we'll, we'll elect a leader. But it's basically releasing them all so we get like all our back ends are up now. Um, and uh, I guess there's probably a good way of proving that with like looking at the back end. But I just sort of like kept going because the Sensu Kettle was pretty awesome. Um, so what I decided I would do is, uh, let's see, I want to configure. Um, so this is using um, the Sensu Kettle, which again is like a newer thing in, in 2.0 and um, feels pretty darn nice. So this configure is, I'm just pointing at, I don't know, I think it was the first one. I just think I picked an arbitrary one. So that's not the default port number, but that was what it remembered and I need to get a token um, so I can't rely on like the last thing that I spun up. And I am slowly getting good at the super secret default password, which you can read in the docs. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a secret. Um, uh, so what this lets me do now is now I can like start to uh, like look at, um, at events or uh, at uh, entities, not, not cargo generate. Uh, entity? Entity list, yeah. So this is, I guess, the, um, you could think of this as the 2.0 equivalent of sort of clients, except they're not clients, they're more generalized. If that, does that seem about right? There we go. <laughs> um, again, self-taught. Uh, <laughs> so um, what I thought I would do is to try and like add a check into the system, because at this point, like I know I've got agents that are, I'm sorry, they're running they're, they're running over here. They, they decided to boot themselves once they had a back end that was available. Um, but I'm not using configuration management to like lay these checks down and to put software on there. I just sort of want like these agents to like, I want to introduce a new like state and say like, here's a new desired state. Agents figure it out when you can. Um, so what I'm going to do is add an asset. Yeah. And uh, I did not think of, there are more than one ways to, to, to do this. So I'm kind of doing a painfully explicit version. Um, if, you've, you've, if you've used kubectl and you've, if you've used the kubectl create with the dash F and give it sort of a payload, that's all like available in here. I just went for the like, I'm just gonna show all the command line flags. Um, what, what I, all, all I really did is I just made a directory with bin. I put a little like effectively hello world in there tart up that directory. I didn't even gzip it, so like that works too, um, which I found out. And then I got the SHA 512 uh, SHA sum of the thing. And um, so that lets me like just talk to the back end and say like, hey, there's, there's a new named asset that's called hello, um, or hello tar. And then, um, then I'm just gonna, again, like just in the painfully explicit way, I'm just gonna create a check but this check is just running the, this little program, but it's gonna be backed by this asset. Um, and again, this isn't like, I didn't upload this asset to the back end. Um, I'm actually referencing a, like just a static web server. And which web server? Uh, it was actually, this one here was running Nginx, and I just mounted the directory, so it just, it works well enough. <laughs> um, so if I do that, um, what you'll see up here is you'll see like three requests from uh, this odd thing called the Go HTTP client, which are the Sensu agents that uh, saw that, hey, I have a new check. Hey, there's an asset that I need. I'm going to go pull that down and execute it. So if I go and ask um, 
the, uh, for the, the Sensu events. Um, you'll see the uh, Heia Sensu Summit with, uh, this is basically like Docker host names. Um, so here are all the agents basically like now executing that new kind of desired state by sort of pulling what they need and making that forward progress. Um, and that did not take a whole lot of work to figure out, by the way. So um, I'll, I'll give like a free plug <laughs> to the Sensu team. Um, it feels really good and it, it's really simple and straightforward. Um, so the last thing I'll do is show you kind of a habitat equivalent of that idea of like, let me just give you a new desired state and you just figure out how to like react and make your forward progress. And I will do that by just very quickly um, switching over to, uh, this is the habitat kind of build service which we call Builder, which is both a package repository and a like a continuous build service. Um, and what I'm showing is my sort of namespace, we call that an origin. Um, so this is my origin. I go this way to get up here. And uh, I've, been, I've made a few, uh, few package builds of this particular one. And um, if you've ever used like uh, Google Chrome or Firefox and you wanna get like those, uh, those dev builds or canary builds, um, then you probably are familiar with that idea of like a release channel that like either want the stable or I want the like cool and, and like aggressive. So we have this a similar concept in Habitat, we call them release channels and they do kind of exactly that. Um, so our default kind of one that you would probably normally wanna pull from is the stable channel. And um, all I'm really gonna do is take this newer build and, and promote it to stable, which in effect uh, is gonna all our agents that are running, they were told, go and look at the stable release channel, and if you see an update, go and update. So um, I could do it here, uh, but instead I think I'm going to actually do it on the command line. Um, and so uh, basically putting something on a channel, we call that package promotion. So uh, again, this is back to a habitat thing. I'm giving sort of, uh, in this case, that ethnical sensu agent with all the stuff and the date looking thing, that's a, a package identifier. And in this case, we've like sort of fully qualified it. So you could think of this as like a completely locked down unique artifact. It's the only one that would ever apply. And I'm gonna promote this one to the stable channel um, so that we'll see by the time I get back to, um, this is our agents running. Um, because they're all going on their own clock, like this is either gonna happen soon or it's gonna take a minute, I don't know. I also booted this one first and then waited a long time. So on their own schedule, because that's what I told them to do, they will see that update, decide to like pull down, install, and uh, restart themselves, and then they're kind of back at, at the next version. So if you have needs for something like this, like a something that feels like a self-updating software system, you can sort of think and use Habitat in that way as well. And yeah, here we got the first ones going, um, and I think, Let's see if I can get, I don't know if I can. Oh, cool, I found a hot key to lock my own workstation. <laughs> yeah. I, cool oh, maybe it's a hot corner. Yeah. Um, oh, this is why. I've been rocking two laptops lately, and the function and the control key are swapped. This has not been fun. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to find it, but the, uh, the line noise and forward motion you saw was basically the, the updates. So I could ask the, um, uh, the supervisor sort of what version they are and you can just sort of trust that that happened. Um, so, so that similar idea that like there was an actor out on the edge, in this case it was the habitat supervisor and we sort of put a new state in the system and it's sort of like pulling and making its forward progress without a central thing having to like go and make sure that like either we all go together or to like make sure it happened. Um, so that's what I've got for the demo. I don't yeah, know if you cool. have any other. Only one slide just to wrap up. Do you up have a slide? So one more password, right? One more password. <laughs> My laptop is telling me that the PDX DevOps monthly meetup is tonight at 6.30. So. That's exciting times. Yeah. <laughs> Are we three for three? Find out. No pressure. Type my password live. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> All right, so thanks so much for that demo, Fletcher. Hopefully you got a taste of 
kind of what autonomous systems can actually bring to you. And what Fletcher was really showing off is it really changes the notion of how you do release management, right? If you thought of doing release management previously with like a really orchestrated approach where again, you're sequentially being like, do this, do that, then do this. This kind of thing is just like, I just want a new version. This is the new state that I want everything to be in. And to have that cluster just be like, I'm going to go and self-coordinate that rollout. And by the way, there's different strategies um, that Fletcher didn't mention, right? So you can have you know, one at a time rollout and things like that, right? Which allows you to simulate kind of canary deploys or blue-green. It's just a really great experience for you to, uh, when you're rolling out software. So um, autonomous systems, right? I, I think modern architectures, uh, just to wrap up three major points, modern architectures really demand us to have this, instead of having a choreo uh, orchestrated approach, really we call it choreography. It's a lot easier to, to understand rather than be like, here's the global state that I need to page into my brain in order to understand what's going on and to, to actually roll things out. Um, because at scale, your biggest problem with this um, is around fleet management and organizational complexity and cognitive complexity, rather than you making the actual changes to the system. And then finally, both Habitat and Sensu are examples of this sort of edge-centric, autonomous actor kind of model, and Fletcher has shown off some of the benefits of that, and just creating a really great experience for you. And they work really well together, yeah. as you can kind of see, right? Peanut butter and jelly. So with that, thank you very much for your time, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was fantastic. Thank you both for that uh, extensive demo that really shows how it, it changes the paradigm of how we do releases. It, it's uh, fascinating. Uh, we have time for just maybe one question if you have one in the room. And I've got one from the Twitters. I have to do it because it's really thoughtful. Do we have a live stream? Uh, sure. No, we don't. Oh. No, no. Uh, we've got a uh, we've got a tweet stream. It's like a ah, like, some live tweeting too. is getting it. So, Rich, props to you. You, you tweeted the, the pull, don't push uh, first slide, and Donnie Burkholtz had a question. He's like, I'd like to hear how this works in the context of data exposure and PCI compliance. And particularly, I don't want to expose everything to anyone who heads over to that server and checks it out, and also don't want to maintain millions of one-to-one -one firewall rules. So maybe could you talk about the exposure uh, that happens with Habitat and how that fits into a PCI context? Does he mean like the? Does he mean the management data, the go, the data that's being gossiped around the system? How to secure that in the global system state and things like that? My understanding is uh, just the premise of going to a, a pull-based model would lead to further exposure as opposed to a, a push-based model. So I guess uh, yeah, I guess I'm still on. It's, it's a little <laughs> laggy on Twitter, so I don't know if I can clarify too much. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, I guess as far as sort of for the for the pull-based system. Um, uh, I kind of look at it as like what are you pulling from and how many of those sources like what are kind of like your your sort of like ingress and egress like what are your points of communication um, as far as like habitat and the supervisor goes uh, there is an element of like you can kind of sort of choose your own adventure a little bit um, there's a way to run sort of habitat and the supervisor where there is no ring if you don't have to collaborate with anybody that's fine um, like in the example of the sensu agent package that, that idea of that like service bind, if I was to run the same thing without the bind, there's a configuration value that I could substitute in for you know, one or more of the, the back end. So if I needed to, uh, if, if I couldn't operate you know, a, uh, a habitat ring either, yeah, I don't know, like across environments or uh, across like uh, boundaries, um, there's more than a few ways like that we could, we could handle that. Um, and as far as like the, the for the pull base, um, as far as the, like, the supervisor is concerned, most of that is like package updates and stuff. And the default is, um, we have a lot of defaults where we try to like, not, uh, not take risky actions and do the safest thing we can by default. So by default, it's not doing any update checking and it's not updating itself at all. So if you think of yourself in a, like, an immutable container environment, that is probably the most reasonable, safe thing you could do is like, you, you probably don't want to do updates within your container. Although if you want to, like, just turn that on and like, do it. Um, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of up to you in that sense. Yeah. Very cool. um, I guess in, in terms of the, the configuration and like that, that gossip information, um, that is stuff that we're sort of actively working on and working with um, kind of our open source community but, but also our commercial customers to make sure that like what we're doing is gonna work in those environments like for real. Um, so that is an ongoing thing. So I, I'm not sure if that's enough uh, depth but if, if you're interested, um, either find Julian or I or anybody at the chef booth or 
or I'm going to probably find that tweet and see if we can follow I'm up. I'm assuming what Donnie's talking about is sharing of that control data between a PCI cardholder data environment and not. And those are some of the things that Fletcher and I are, are talking about, right? So if you have those two separate environments, there's certain state that you want to communicate between those environments and certain state that you actually don't want to control or that you want to control that, that data flow, right? So those are some of the features that we're working on to figure out. Okay, so how do you, how do you determine how to build that spigot in, to, in, in terms of how, how you um, how do you tune what information flows across that bound? Very cool. Well, we haven't been live streaming, but I did just record that answer for you. So sorry you can be here, Donnie, but I'll post this soon. <laughs> yeah. Hi, this Donnie. is Sensu Summit. You should be here next year. Yeah. This is some cool tech going on yeah. here. I know. I'm a, we have the technology. We can do this. Sure do. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, I don't see any. Uh, Kelsey, do you have a question? He, he no. vanished. Just Oh, there he is. No? no. You're good. You're okay. good. All right. So we'll follow up more offline. Thank you both. Another round of applause for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you.